Hello, this is Dr. Tom Gerard, and I'd like to welcome you to week number six. And uh, I decided to just go ahead and record my news entry and uh, see how that works, because typing out a bunch of stuff uh, is not quite as efficient as if I can talk to you. Uh, so tonight, this week, we're talking about risk and rates of return. I'd like to share some things with you about this. So I've got this PowerPoint and I'm just going to skip around here real quick because I don't, I'm not going to go through everything, but I just like to hit some of the high points. So we're talking about defining and measuring risk. So anytime that you have an investment, um, whether that's in a, you're a company and you're investing in assets for the company or whether you're an investor looking to uh, purchase stock. And remember in the finance world, a company issuing stock is to attract um, investors because we get uh, our money that we get, our cash flow comes from either retained earnings or debt, as we saw in the last chapter with bonds, or with issuing equity, which would be where we're selling stock to people uh, in return for money. So one of the things that they start talking about is uh, probability distributions and probabilities of something happening because, you know, there is a certain proper, uh, probability that an unexpected event will occur. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to assess uh, the probability of something happening that's unexpected. And um, so, you know, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the probability uh, situation, but here you have a 40% chance of rain, a 60% chance of no rain. There's always a 100% chance that it's going to be one of these things. How does this relate to a company? So take a look. Here we have two companies, Martin Products and U.S. Electric. The electric company is a is a uh, typically a blue chip stock. It's going to be uh, relatively stable. People are not going to, everybody needs electric, whether the economy is good or bad. It's not like something you can really shop around for. And so it's typically uh, utility companies are considered pretty safe investments. Martin Products, on the other hand, could be an upstart, uh, a new company. And so what this is talking about here is the state of the economy. We don't know what's going to happen in the economy. If things remain normal, which we're saying here, the probability of things being normal in the economy is 50%. 50% probability uh, that nothing's going to really change in the near future. Uh, and if that was the case, then Martin Products would have a 22% return on my, uh, my investment, where if I invested in U.S. Electric, it would only have a 16%. So pretty close, but a little bit more on, a, on this particular uh, Martin uh, company. Uh, so now, if we, if the economy takes off and is booming, uh, there's a 20% chance in our scenario here that that could happen. And um, in that case, look at Martin, 110% uh, you know increase in value we're getting, and at the electric company we're only getting 20%. So it's dramatic uh, that I, given the fact that if we have a booming economy, which there's a 20% of that happening in our scenario that this would be an, a, a fantastic investment. However, if we look at, if something goes wrong and we hit a recession, which is a 30% chance of that happening, according to this scenario, uh, you'll see what happens to Martin here. We lose 60% of our value. Whereas the electric company, even though there's a recession and, and, and this is saying uh, that the economy has taken a downturn, uh, we're still going to realize a 10% um, increase in value. So this is just showing a dramatic effect between different types of companies. So when people are investing uh, in different companies, stable companies, not going to get rich overnight, uh, but yet somewhat safe. So this is, you know, less risk. Here, you take on more risk, you have a huge uh, potential for making more profits, but you also have the potential of losing your investment. So in the expected rate of return, we have an expectation that we're going to get a return on our investment uh, 
and that probabilities of whether it's going to be good or bad is what we're talking about is a weighted average of outcomes where the weights are the probabilities. All right, so and again we get some formulas here um, and again there's quite a bit of information on uh, statistics and so here we talk about risk adverse investors. Uh, these are you know would be considered a person that doesn't like risk, requires a higher rate of return to invest in higher risk securities. And, and we're going to call that the risk premium, the premium that I expect because I have higher risk, so I expect a higher premium or higher uh, return on my investment. And here we, we see a uh, graph where, uh, and we'll talk about this here, risk-free return here in just a minute. Uh, but you'll see as the risk, the R's, go up, the, um, you know, the more expectation I have for a higher return. As most of you know, one of the ways that people tend to try to reduce their risk in a, is to diversify their uh, stock investments so that we would create a portfolio of different stocks and there are certain things that you could do uh, so combining stocks that are not perfectly correlated will reduce the portfolio risk through diversification so what this means is if I'm investing in all oil stocks uh, and say I um, have British Petroleum and I have Royal Dutch Shell and I have Exxon Mobil and something goes uh, south on the uh, oil market then uh, my whole portfolio is highly correlated. In other words, I have a lot of investment in the same types of stock. So if uh, oil crashes, then my entire portfolio crashes. So what I want to do is I want to have uh, I want to have stocks that are, are, are not correlated. And that means that uh, I, if I'm going to invest in um, ExxonMobil, then maybe I want to yeah, invest in Walmart or Microsoft or something that's completely uh, unrelated to to the oil stock. So the, if oil crashes, then perhaps maybe not my uh, technical stocks or my retail stocks. So uh, again, now the number of stocks in the portfolio uh, reduces its risk because there I could have uh, you know stocks from all different sectors. So if one sector crashes, then the rest of them kind of hold together. Uh, the smaller the positive correlation, the lower the risk. And the greater the negative correlation, the lower the risk. In other words, the more different the stocks are in what they do and what they're related to. So this is what you call uh, firm-specific risk versus market risk. The market we're talking about here is the entire stock market. Uh, and many times, you know, what is used as uh, a gauge is the S&P 500, the 500 largest stocks. Uh, and so we might call uh, the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 the market. Uh, and so if you were able to invest in every stock on those uh, exchanges, then, then you would be, you know, very diversified. If you, on the other hand, if you just had some a few stocks, maybe you have Coca-Cola and you have Pepsi, then you got a problem because you have uh, two very similar stocks. Now the one thing you have to understand is the market in itself, there's a certain market risk. And as we know, we, we hear the news when, um, you know, the, the uh, Dow crashes or the NASDAQ goes down or the market is in a down uh, you know, cycle. Um, and so this risk that's going to happen is the entire market risk. We have no control about that. So we can't diversify away from that because we're investing in the market. And so if the market goes down, uh, then, you know, our investments are going to go down. This is non-diversifiable risk or systematic risk. We have no way to control that. So we have a concept of uh, what we call the beta coefficient. 
and that talks about how my specific stock uh, moves with the, or with uh, with or with uh, different from the market. So um, if it's moving with the market or it's moving different from me, different from the market. The market is extremely well diversified um, because it involves all the investments. And so our average stock should move uh, right with the market. And again, like I said, typically we might use the S&P 500 as the gauge. So when we look at a individual stock, we might be comparing it to the S&P 500 to see how it's moving uh, with or with, without the market. Uh, so you'll see here um, a beta of 0.5. The stock is only half as volatile or risky as the average stock. And uh, the one, the stock has uh, the same risk. It's 100% it's uh, perfectly correlated. And two, the, top, the stock is twice as risky as the average stock. So we know now that the market has a risk. Uh, the required rate of return now must include this, what we're calling a risk-free return. So we have to get a return on our investment because there's a, a, um, a market risk. Just the idea that we're in the market causes risk. So this is risk-free return. There's nothing we can do about that, but we have to account for that when we're trying to get our required rate of return. And then we add to that our premium for the risk, the risk of the beta on how, uh, how volatile it is compared to the market uh, and other uh, market risk. Here's the market risk, the RM. This... Um, chapter introduces you to the idea of the capital asset pricing model, uh, a model used to determine the required rate of return on an asset. It's based on the proposition that an asset's required re rate of return should equal the risk-free rate here, plus a risk premium that reflects the asset's non-diversifiable risk, the risk that we can't get rid of from diversification. So there's a lot of um, ideas when we're talking about risk and return uh, when investing in stocks. Uh, so, so think about some of these things. So stock prices are not constant due to changes in the risk-free rate, the market risk premium, the beta coefficient, the stock's expected growth rate, and changes in the expected dividend. So each of these things uh, could affect a stock, and each stock, because it's an individual company, has is is affected differently in each of these areas. And so that's why uh, this is filled with formulas. And and uh, again, when we're talking about probabilities of things happening, a lot of this is subjective. It's based upon historical records. But as you know, they always have the disclaimer: uh, past performance is not uh, an indication of any kind of guarantee of the future. So lastly, here's some different um, types of risk that you see is uh, interest rate risk, you know, whether the feds will increase or decrease interest rates. And of course, that has all kinds of impacts on businesses. Interest rates going down uh, in one way uh, allows, it, the idea is to put more cash available but it also reduces the tax liability of debt. Um, inflationary factors that happen that we have no control over. Maturity, this is a, the, the length of time. So the longer that we hold something in theory, uh, the, the more likely that there's, there's risk. Uh, when, when banks look at loaning money, they like to loan with, and let's talk about unsecured loans then they like to loan on short term because the longer that the note is out there, the more things that can go wrong, the more risk. How about liquidity? Is this for something that I could, uh, I could turn to cash real quickly? If I was buying an asset with money that I borrowed, uh, could I turn this, uh, this asset into cash right away?
or would it be something like a house where we have to sell it and there's all kinds of costs associated with it? Exchange rate, uh, investing in, in um, worldwide, different worlds, different exchanges, uh, the value of the dollar as compared to the other uh, monetary units of foreign countries uh, also has a great impact, especially on multinational com uh, com companies. And then the political risk. Political risks, if you're, uh, suppose you're a, a business that gets a lot of their supplies or raw materials from a foreign country, and the political situation in those countries are, can be very volatile. Okay, well, that's all I'm going to talk about now, risk and rates return, and um, I hope that that's helpful a little bit. Uh, and so you also have a midterm on your management accounting. Go ahead and uh, review that and try to uh, do the best you can, and if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. Thank you.